Hi, I'm Steve Duke, and this is the Two Roads Podcast. I started this podcast earlier this year because I was going through this journey where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next with my life. And I realized that there was a lot of other people in a very similar situation to me. They'd gone to college, they'd gotten a job out of college, and maybe they were in their 20s and their 30s and were kind of realizing that actually this wasn't really what they wanted to do. There was something else that they wanted to do in their life, something that they thought would give them a bit more meaning, a bit more satisfaction and a sense of purpose. And I was going off embarking on this journey. I was lucky enough that I've been able to take a few months off work and really dedicate myself to trying to figure this out for myself. And as part of that, I was going to talk to a lot of people who I thought had had interesting careers, interesting life journeys, and had in their own way found a life and a job that brings them happiness. That was back in January of this year. So it's four months later, and I've had conversations with 13 people, over 20 hours of conversations, and I've learned so much from it. And so today on the episode, what I want to do is share all of those learnings. Specifically, I'm going to share the top five things that I've taken away from these 20 hours of conversations that I've had with people who've built a life that they love. So whether you've listened to all the episodes, just a couple of them, or even none at all, I don't think it really matters because what I try and do today is just pull out the common threads across all of these 13 people and summarize them for you in a way that is going to be helpful. So if you're thinking about changing careers, if you're thinking about trying to find out what it is that you want to do in your life or trying to find some ways that maybe you can find a bit more meaning or purpose or satisfaction in your life, I think this will be really helpful. I really enjoyed this process of listening back to all the episodes and figuring out what those common threads were across everybody because they actually weren't obvious to me even though I was obviously in the conversations in the first place. I'm back in Ireland right now for a couple of weeks and when I was traveling back on the plane, this is what I was doing. I was listening back to the conversations and I really enjoyed it. And so I think it's going to be helpful. I hope it is. And without further ado, let's get into the show. So the first thing I've learned from all of the conversations I've had is that the pain of change is worth it. Pretty much everybody I spoke to is doing something different now to what they were doing a few years ago. And in general, well, actually all the time, they're happier. And oftentimes these were big changes. They had to leave jobs that paid them really well, jobs that were really secure. They had to deal with their parents or their family thinking that they were stupid. They had to deal with financial pressures. They had to deal with not really knowing what it was that they were going to go and do but every single time they went through that change it was painful and they've come out the other side in a place where they are much happier and they're finding much more satisfaction from what they do and overall much more meaning from their lives and I say that because here's a situation that you might be in right you work a job and you like it you don't love it but you like it definitely don't hate it it's grand pay is good It's secure, you get lots of holidays, nice perks, nice benefits. It's well respected. You work for a company that maybe people recognize. And when you go out, you can tell people that, oh, yeah, I work here and um, this is my job. And people get it. They understand what it is that you do. And that's nice. And I've been there. I, I know that. But you've always thought that there might be something else out there that you'd like to do instead. You might feel that there's just something a bit missing. And I wrote a LinkedIn post about this recently, which was kind of titled, is this it? And I think that's a lot of times the question people have is they're doing something that they like, but they're like, is this it? I kind of thought I'd be feeling something a little bit more than what I do, right? And what's hard about this situation is stuff is good. You're getting paid well. You have all these benefits. Life is nice. You have a nice apartment, nice life, nice car, whatever else it is. And the question you're asking yourself is, well, is it worth the pain of changing? Okay, sure, maybe there's something else I might want to do, but is it worth going through, giving up all the progress that I've made? Can I justify giving up all the work that I've put into this over the last few years and taking a risk on something new? Is the pain and the risk of changing really worth it? And what I've learned from all these people that I've talked to is that it is. 
I just think it's really hard to be happy in life long term, to feel like that deep sense of life satisfaction, that you have a meaning, that you have a purpose, unless you're doing something that you really love in your work. And when I talked to Brian Moylet, he had a great point, which was, you know what makes your heart sing and you have to go and do that. That was his point. And that's not easy. If you're not doing that right now, it's going to be painful to change it. But what I've learned from talking to all these people is that it is worth it. And there's this great analogy that I heard recently from this guy called David Brooks, and he calls it life's two mountains. And so this is a story that he found happens in a lot of people's lives. It's very typical. People get out of school, they get out of university, and they see a mountain that they want to climb. That might be a specific career that they want to pursue and that they want to get to the top of. They work hard and they climb this mountain. After some years, they achieve success. They get to the top of this mountain. But when they look around, they realize that they're not really fully satisfied with being on top of this mountain. They know that there's something else that they want from life. They don't feel, feel fulfilled by being on top of this mountain. And they realize, ah, this wasn't my mountain to climb. And some people will sit on that mountain and they'll sit up there not feeling satisfied because it's nice. It's nice to be on top of a mountain. But other people will make the choice to come back down and they'll say, okay, this isn't my mountain. I'm going to come back down off it. I have to come back down off it because there's another mountain waiting for me somewhere else. So they decide to come down and now they're standing in the valley at the bottom of this mountain in its shadow. And being in this valley is painful because you can feel lost. You don't know what the other mountain is that you want to climb. And that's a not nice feeling. And that's, I've been there when it's like, I know that's not my mountain, but I don't know where my other mountain is. And that's painful in itself. But when you're in this valley, you can look around and, and hopefully, and this is what I'm kind of trying to do with this podcast and some of the tips and stories that I'm helping, that I'm trying to tell is that you can find your next mountain. And people do. People do. Everybody that I've talked to on this podcast has found their next mountain. And in general, like the, the research that David Brooks has done on large data sets has found that in general, people do find their second mountain. But finding it, and then climbing it is painful as well because you're now starting at the bottom of another mountain and that's really annoying. You had to get to the top of this first one and now you're back at the bottom of another one and you got to figure out and you got to go and climb it. But what was interesting from David Brooks's story is that when people find their second mountain, it tends to be something that's more focused on an intrinsic sense of happiness. The first mountain is often about building identity, building ego. And the second mountain is often about pouring it all back. It's often a more spiritual mountain, um, a mountain that's closer to what you find intrinsically satisfying, usually a bit less focused on things like you know, money and status, but there's nothing wrong with those. I'm really not saying there is. But the statistics show that people feel more satisfied when they climb this second mountain. They find a greater sense of meaning and purpose in life from doing this. And the point here is that climbing the second mountain is painful. You don't want to come down from the first one that you're on. You're at the top of it, but it is worth it. The pain of change is worth it. And there's so many examples from the people I've talked to to prove this. So Ogie Hollywood, I think it was episode three, I was talking to him. He was working at Google, had this amazing job, really great pay, great benefits that come with Google. He says himself that it was great when he went out in the city at the weekend, people would ask him, well, what do you do? And he could say, oh, I work at Google. People are always super impressed by that. And that's great. And he had to leave that where well, he decided to leave that because he wasn't finding full satisfaction from it, move to Bali and start from scratch in a very different industry, building his own business. Alicia Conlon heard she's somebody else who did this. She was working in a fantastic job, super high paying, six-figure salary. She left that to start her own business. 
And the first four businesses that she started all failed. That's painful. But she's now come out the far side of it where she finally does have a business that she runs and she runs it with a partner. They've just moved to Bali and they've crafted this life that they get so much satisfaction from. So the change and the pain was worth it. And talking to these people, what I found is actually very inspiring because they took the hard option. They were on top of the mountain. They decided, I'm going to come down off of this. I'm going to go and go searching for the second mountain that I want to climb. And then I'm going to climb it. But it's motivating and it's inspiring because when I talk to them and I hear how satisfied they are being on the second mountain, it makes me want to go and do the same. The second thing I learned from all these conversations is that you have to grab the steering wheel. If you're trying to find a job and build a life that you love and that brings you satisfaction, no one else is going to do it for you. You have to grab the steering wheel and you have to drive the car yourself to this destination. So finding out what you want to do and changing careers, like it really is hard. But when I talked to Rose Radford on one of the episodes, she said, it's okay not to know the answer, but it's not okay not to try. You have to take control of the process. You have to grab the steering wheel and you have to own it. Your dream job is just not going to fall from the sky. And the people that I have talked to at one point, they all decided this. They all decided consciously that they were going to build a job and a life that they love. And they took that as a responsibility and they owned it. And I think there's two things that you need to make this happen. The first one is what I already said. You just need to make this con conscious decision that this is now a job for you. You're going to grab the steering wheel and you're going to say, okay, I'm not loving what I'm doing right now, but I'm going to take responsibility for finding out what it is that I really do want to do and then going and make that happen. You make this conscious decision and you treat this almost like your job. This is your goal, your job, whatever it is. The second thing is you need a process. And I found this from my personal experience as well. Trying to solve this problem is extremely ambiguous, right? What do I want to do with my life? Like, where do you even start when you're trying to answer that question? It's incredibly difficult. And I struggled with that a bit. I would have just done random stuff, like really random stuff, like journaling or, you know, brainstorming, coming up with ideas. And it doesn't really get you closer because it's too ambiguous a problem. And also nobody else is going to check in on you and be like, oh, Stephen, like, how are you getting on with figuring out what you want to do with your life? Like, no one else is going to do that. So you need a process. You need a structure for yourself to hold yourself accountable. And the best process that I have found from this, which is what Alicia Condon Heard recommended to me, was this book called How to Design Your Life. And in episode seven, I basically went through the whole book and summarized it for you. So I would recommend going and reading the book. If you want a shortcut, just listen to episode seven. But the book is great. And it's this best-selling book from two Stanford professors who give you this framework for figuring out what you want to do from, from your life, what you want to get from your life, how to build a life that you love. And it's really structured. And I just love it. It gives you step-by-step -step process to figure out, you know, where are you today in your life? What parts of it are maybe missing for you that you want to improve on? And then building that plan for how you're going to go and improve on them and figuring out what career you want to do and then making that career happen. And I really just couldn't recommend it more. So that was the second lesson that I learned when I talked to all these people is that they had grabbed the steering wheel. They were taking control about building a life that they loved. And a lot of them had also implemented this process as well. Not necessarily the how to design your life process, but some form of process where they took this as a job and a responsibility that they were going to do. They were going to go and figure out what it was that they wanted to make happen. And then they were going to make that happen. And I loved one of the things that Rose Radford, Rose Radford talked about in this, which was about getting practical. Because a lot of people might be sitting in a job that they don't love. And there's always a reason for them not to move. And I totally get that. I really empathize with that because I've been in the same place. I've stuck in jobs that I didn't love just because, because of momentum. And you'd always come up with an excuse not to do it. But Rose's advice was to get practical figure out exactly why are you not doing the thing that you want to do so that might be well i don't know what it is that i want to do okay well there you go there's your first problem to solve your first problem to solve is to figure out what you do want to do and build a plan around that it might be 
oh, I don't have, I don't have enough money to leave my job. And that's a very realistic scenario for a lot of people as well. So, okay, well, how can we solve this? Can you, you know, reduce your expenses? Can you save up? Can you build a plan to tackle this problem? And I think that's all coming back to that idea of grabbing the steering wheel, taking control, defining the problems that are in your way, and then going and solving those. And that was pretty much common across everybody that I talked to. They're very conscious about building this life. There's very few people that I talk to. I don't think anybody who was like, oh yeah, I love my life. I love the job that I do. I have this fantastic life. And I, if I asked them, how did it happen? They would go, oh, I don't know. It just, it was, it was just luck. And may, I'm sure those people are out there and I'm very jealous of those people. But the people that I've talked to, they've been conscious about it. it it's been a very conscious decision where they say, this is something I'm going to do. And then they go and make it happen. And that's, that's the second lesson that I learned. You have to grab the steering wheel if you're going to build a life and get a job that you really love. Okay, hold up one second. I'm sorry to have to interrupt this episode, but I do want to remind you that if you want more content on how to find a job and a life that you love, you can find it on our socials. So on Instagram, go to Two Roads Pod, and on LinkedIn, just find my personal account called Steve Duke. And of course, these podcasts are released weekly where I interview people and that's extremely helpful for people to get inspiration and hear other people's stories and what how they did it and what they're going through. But I also release a ton of other content as well to help you both figure out what it is that you want to do and also how to then make that actually happen. So LinkedIn and Instagram and LinkedIn, Steve Duke, just my name. And then on Instagram, you can find us at two roads pod. The third thing that I learned from all the people that I talk to is that you have to become a student of yourself. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you want to build a life you love, if you want to figure out what job it is that you want to do, you need to know some core things about yourself. You need to know your values. You need to know your strengths. You need to know your weaknesses, what you like and what you dislike. And you may not have thought much about these before and that's okay but if you're going to try and find out what you really want to do you need to know these you need to become a student of yourself and pretty much everyone that I'd spoken to was very much a student of themselves they knew a lot about themselves they had a lot of self-awareness when they asked them questions around what do they value or what's their like or what's their ideal day look like or what do they want to be doing you know in the future they had they had pretty good answers for these and it was clear that they thought through a lot of them beforehand and it's really important if you're, I, I think building this, I think there's two things to it. One is training your muscle of self-awareness. And then the second thing is doing conscious activities to actually write these things down, to write down what it is that you value, what it is that you like. And step two is really helpful for this because in that process of, you know, designing your life or whatever process that it is that you choose to do, you probably will end up writing down your values you probably will end up going through exercises of trying to figure out what it is that you enjoy doing during a specific day and not enjoy doing so that's really good but you have to become a student of yourself you have to spend time building that muscle of self-awareness and i find that there can be a challenge when trying to study ourselves from my own experience and this challenge is that we have two layers when we ask ourselves any question like, what is it that I like doing? We initially go to the first layer of ourselves and we look for an answer there. And this layer is often what we would like to think about ourselves or for what we would, the answer that we would want, we think others might want to hear. So, for example, if I ask myself, what do I enjoy doing? on a day-to-day basis, or what part of my work is it that I enjoy? I might say that I love working with numbers, that I love building Excel models. When I look for the answer in my first layer, and why do I say this? Well, because for 20 years of my life, I was basically told that I was good at maths, I was good at physics, I was always good at this in school, I went, I studied engineering, I went into a job where it was super analytical, and there was a lot of value in being able to do this. And so my first level of awareness, this is what I think, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, like I guess I guess I like working with numbers. Yeah, I like working with numbers. It, it it's an easy answer. It's the one that comes to to mind very easily. 
But to get to the true answer, you need to go a level deeper. You need to go into this second layer. And this is where your true emotions sit and your true, you let go of a lot of those things about what would you like the answer to be? Or what do you think others would like the answer to be? You don't really involve your ego as much. So if you're asking about strengths and weaknesses, you're able to actually give more honest answers when you tap into this level and you actually say, do you know what, I'm, I'm shy to that. I actually really am shy to that. And so when I ask myself that same question, when I think about, well, what's, when I go to the second layer and I say, well, do I like working with numbers? I kind of say, well, what's really going on for me when I'm working in Excel? Do I feel motivated about that? Do I feel passionate about it? And the answer is usually no. And so it's important to be able to tap into that second layer when you're trying to study yourselves and get to the true answers because you really don't want to go through these exercises and figure out your values, what you like and dislike and come up with a load of answers that are only from your first layer because then you're going to go and end up doing something based on that and you can't trick yourself. Subconsciously, you, you will know that this is not bringing you satisfaction and you're not enjoying it. And I don't have actually a formula for how to tap into this second layer. I'm not really sure. Some people are probably very good at it. Maybe some people need to practice it. For me, I was always very bad at understanding my own emotions, right? And I would only ever tap into this first layer if somebody asked me how I felt about something. Um, and it was therapy for me that helped me understand how to how to understand what I'm feeling and what that actually meant. But you know, for other people, it could be something completely different. I think the only thing that I would take away from this is that it is important and that you, it's very helpful if you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life to become a student in your, of yourself, to invest in the ability to be self-aware, to be honest with yourself and try as often as possible to tap into this second layer when answering these big questions about yourself. And there's a few examples about being a student of yourself from the conversations that I've had. So the first one I had was with Ash Reed. So he just has so much clarity on the life that he wants to live. He's thought about it a lot and he knows. He knows what his ideal day looks like. He knows it doesn't include spending 10 hours in front of the screen. And because he's invested that time to figure out what, what he really likes, and to learn about himself, he's then able to go and build his job, build his life around that. Ella Lyons, back in episode one, she talked about the importance of self-awareness. She said, you have to understand your own emotions. Otherwise, you won't know why you like something or why you dislike something. You're just like, oh, I didn't really like that. But you won't learn anything from it if you don't have the ability to understand your own emotions. Alicia Conlon heard she has something very similar. She knows exactly what her ideal day looks like. She could tell me from the moment she woke up to the moment she went to sleep what her ideal day looks like. She knows exactly how much money she wants to take home every single month. And that's because she's a student of herself and she's invested the time and the effort in building that skill and, and writing it down. It's really important. Like write down what it is that your values are, what it is that you like, what it is that you dislike, what your strengths are. Um, and, you know, keep that as kind of a living document. It can be very helpful. It's also really fun. It's really enjoyable to go through um, this as a process and like figure out what all these things are. So um, that's us number three, become a student of yourself. Okay, three then, two more to go. Quick recap on the first three that we've gone through. Number one, the pain of change is worth it. It's worth it to go and come down off of that first mountain if you don't like it there and go and find another one and climb that one. Number two is that you have to grab the steering wheel. Nobody else is going to drive the car for you. If you want to get somewhere, you need to put your hands on the steering wheel and drive the fucking thing there yourself. Number three, become a student of yourself. Invest the time and energy to become self-aware, understand what you really like, what your values are, and, and, and write them down. So let's move on to number four, which is appreciating the value of risk. Everybody I spoke to who, and I, and I think most of them, right? I think the common thread about most of them, and this is what I try and do in the podcast. I try and talk to people who I think have 
built a life that they find very meaningful, that they are satisfied with, that they're happy with, because we can learn a lot from those types of people and their journey to get there. And one thing that's common across almost all of them is that they've taken risks, some of them small, some of them big, but they all understand the value of risk. Oftentimes we look at risk. I did this for a very long time. I look at risk as a bad thing. Risk is only a bad thing. When people say that's risky, I think, oh, that's bad. But actually, risk is just the price you have to pay for the chance of getting something amazing, for the chance of a great outcome. And when you think about it this way and you appreciate the value of risk, you can approach decisions differently. Now, I don't recommend stupid risks. Right? There are some dumb... Just because you appreciate the value of risk doesn't mean that you should do dumb things. If you're make, looking at a decision, you should, of course, weigh up the upsides versus the downsides. But the thing that I've done and I think is worthwhile to do is look at your risk dial. If you were to rank the amount of risk that you take in your life out of 10, where are you sitting? Are you a one? Are you a two? Are you a seven, eight, nine? Where are you sitting? How much risk are you taking? For me, for a long time, my risk dial was super low. I was at a two out of 10. Didn't take risks professionally, socially, whatever. I just didn't do it. And it's safe and it feels safe. But the problem is that you don't see the opportunities that you're missing out on. You don't see all the good things that you didn't get because you didn't take risks. And if you were to imagine a parallel universe where in that parallel universe, you could see all the things that you got or you would have got if you'd taken that risk, I think you would, I think we would probably all look at risk a little bit differently. And when the, the people I've talked to have told me their story, what struck me was they didn't know that they were, when they started off on this journey, that they were going to end up where they were today. Oftentimes it was very, very different. They didn't have this clear path in front of them that was guaranteed success. And oftentimes when we see people who are in a certain job or doing a certain thing, it's very easy to think that. It's very easy to think that, oh, well, they just always knew that this was going to happen and they just followed this path. But that's just not the case. They didn't know where they were necessarily going to go, but they took the risk. They took a jump and then they just followed it step by step. Example, Jack O'Mara, I talked to him. He left his job and enrolled in Entrepreneur First, which is essentially a startup incubator slash accelerator, I guess. It helps people meet other co-founders, come up with ideas and start startups. He had no idea if anything would come out of that. There was a very good chance that he went into that, spent a few months of his life doing it, came out the other side with, with nothing, absolutely nothing. And, but he took the risk. And what happened was he met an amazing co-founder that he founded this business with and he's worked on for the last four or five years. He absolutely loves it. He's in a job that he's obsessed with. He finds it so meaningful. He's able to create this big positive impact. And if he didn't take that risk of enrolling in Entrepreneur First, never would have happened. Another one, Ash Reed. He told me about all these cold DMs that he would send on Twitter to try and get jobs. And he got jobs ahead of them, right? He did. He also applied to the same job multiple times, even though he was rejected a couple of years in a row. And they're all risks. Now, they're fantastic risks because what is the downside of sending a DM? They don't reply. Or they reply and they say no. What have you lost? There's absolutely no cost there. That's a fantastic risk to take. Now, when Ash is telling us his story, we don't hear about all the DMs that he got a no from or that he got no reply from at all. But they don't really matter. He understood and he appreciates the value of risk. He can see that by doing these things, he can create really good outcomes for himself. And I find that common across a lot of the people that I talk to. They understand, they appreciate the value of risk. The fifth and final thing that I learned from these conversations, which honestly I think is the most important, is what I call the magic of momentum. I've talked about this a lot, especially on the latest episodes, if you've listened to them. And the reason I think is it's so important is for two reasons. One is I think it solves the problem where a lot of people get stuck. So, and then the second reason is that 
it's applicable to so many things. It's not just applicable to changing jobs, which I know a lot of this podcast is about, but the, I think there's a lot of other things as well that you might want to do in your life. And the magic of momentum can really help with that. So what is it? The magic of momentum basically means that if you if you have a goal that you want to achieve, if there's something that you want to do, the best thing that you can do to achieve that goal is not building a plan. It's not researching it. It's not building the skills to get there. It's just to start with one tiny little thing. Because the second you do one thing, the magic of momentum starts to kick in and it makes it easier to do the second thing. And then it's easier to do the third thing and the fourth thing and the fifth thing. And all those things that you're going to need to do, like build a plan and build the skills and do stuff, you'll have to do all of that. But once you've got momentum, it makes everything else easier. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck when they're trying to figure out what they want to do, change jobs, build a side hustle, whatever else it is. They just can't get going. And it's a real struggle because, you know, they're working a full-time job. They don't have that much time, whatever else it is. But once you get momentum, everything becomes way easier. So that's the takeaway that I have. So many people did this. Ogi Hollywood, if you were to look at what he did, right? He just started, started contracting. He, when he left Google and he was in Bali, he was like, right, I'm going to start doing Google ads, running Google ads for companies. That's where he started. And he just started basic thing. Let's go. Okay. Now he gets that. He gets one client. Then he gets another client, right? The momentum's building. And then he decides, right, I have too many clients. I need to start an agency. I can't just be this anymore. Then he meets other people when he's in Bali. He starts getting into real estate over in Bali. And now what started off with him, and this is, I'm simplifying, of course, this whole story, but what started off with him just going, okay, I'm going to start doing a bit of Google ads. And he actually started this even before that, actually. I, I probably messed up that story a little bit. He would have helped people with their Google ads even before uh, leaving um, moving to Bali, I think. So, but if he hadn't taken that first step, none of that other stuff would have happened, right? And I just think it's so important. So there's a couple of things there. One is the importance of a side hustle. I wrote a post about it on LinkedIn recently, but it's just a great way to start to build momentum alongside your day job for whatever it is that you want to do. The second one is life prototyping. So I'm a big fan of this, which is if you've got something that you think, oh, I, I, I think I'd really like to do this job, just start it. Just go and do it. Find the tiniest way to try that out, whether it's having a conversation with somebody, whether it's trialing it out for a day, do it. And the magic momentum will kick in there as well. So that's the fifth one. It's the final one. I think it's the most important. The five that I have, just to give you a quick recap, number one, the pain of change is worth it. Number two, you have to grab the steering wheel yourself. Number three, become a student of yourself. Number four, appreciate the value of risk. And number five, the magic of momentum. And these five things is what I've learned from these conversations of people who I think have built lives for themselves that they really enjoy. They've got themselves into jobs. They're living places that they like. They've got good work-life balance whatever it is that they want, they figured out what they wanted and then they made it happen. And that's kind of the common thread across all of them. And these were the five traits that I think a lot of them displayed. And I'm going to be taking them more and more into my life. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a bit different, of course, to the usual one, but I think it's helpful to be able to recap on, you know, these 20 hours of conversations and see what, some of the common threads were across all of these different people because they've all done different things, right? Some of them have been a nanny or a personal trainer or have built their own agencies or founded their own startups or their CEOs or whatever else it is. It's all very, they're all very different people. And but these are the traits that I think are common amongst all of them. So as always, if you want more content like this, more content to help you figure out what it is that you want to do with your life, how to find a bit more meaning, a bit more purpose, find a job that you really love. You can follow me on socials on Instagram. It's at two roads pod. That's T W O two roads pod. And then on LinkedIn, you can get me just on my personal profile, uh, Steve Duke. 
other than that, I will be back next week. I'll have a guest next week. It won't just be me. I'll have a guest next week. And you can tune in then for episode 15 of the Two Roads podcast.